Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and it's a great honor to be here uh, to give this talk in this Molecular Frontier Symposium. What I'd like to do today is take you perhaps in a different direction of extremes and approach extremes from the standpoint of chemistry. I've slightly altered my title, but I'll touch on aspects of applications to planets, including our own planet. So what I'd like to do is um, consider molecules in a range of extreme environments. And this is really quite essential for understanding a broad range of physical phenomena beyond Earth and planetary science. And part of the reason this is an interesting area is the application of extreme conditions to molecules, in fact, tells us a great deal that's quite fundamental about the nature of molecules and the kinds of structures, solids, and so on that they form. So if we consider the vast of the universe. Uh, there are a range of extreme environments. We've heard about quite a few today and uh, a number in uh, the previous talk uh, from the very in, uh, ex expanses of, of, of space uh, to uh, very high fields, electromagnetic fields, for example, that we've heard about, gravity fields uh, and particle fluxes. But also, there are the thermodynamic extremes of temperature. We heard about low temperatures, but also pressures, and this means very high densities. And what I'd like to do is highlight some of the recent developments in this field, looking at very high pressures in combination with temperature, give you some examples of recent results. This is a very exciting frontier field. In fact, at the end, touch on a case study, uh, which is a study of hydrogen, and that will include some results that were published, in fact, published just this past week. So in thinking about pressure, I'd like to go back to Robert Boyle, who was interested in the effect of pressure on gases, as we all know, and he developed his famous ideal gas laws. Pressure times volume as a constant is one of them. And in writing this up, he made the very interesting remark in one of his essays, perhaps the pressure of the air might have an interest in more phenomena than men have hitherto thought. And he put this in an essay with a delightful title, Touching the Spring of the Air. And only in the last few years do we realize the full prescience of that remark. The range of pressures in the universe far beyond what Robert Boyle considered, and this was touched on in the previous talk, is really quite impressive. Some 60 orders of magnitude, if we think about that in terms of uh, the one atmosphere unit. Of course, here we are at atmospheric pressure occupying a very small niche in this great space. We've heard about some of the vastness down here, the very high pressures approaching those found inside neutron stars, which is the domain of altogether new physics. As we've heard, what, I like, what I'd like to do today is talk about this range here, which is the range of pressures over which chemical phenomena occur. It's quite a subset of this broader range, but it's still a very interesting one that spans many orders of magnitude. And this is the range of conditions that one needs to understand and appreciate and learn about from the standpoint of planetary interiors. Here's a useful table to convert among various units that are used in this field. It's important to know that 10 kilobars is 1 gigapascal, and 1 megabar is 100 gigapascals. So what I often do in thinking about effective pressure on atoms is to put together a, a structure like this. Uh, this is an idealized array of simple atoms with electrons that are circulating around the nuclei. And you can see that in this simple model, on compression, one reaches a critical regime in which the electrons are no longer stable. There's overlap of the orbits. And they're ripped off the nuclei and form an itinerant structure. That is, 
some kind of dense plasma, or another way of saying this is a very dense metal. So this is a very simple illustration of an insulator metal transition, which is really fundamental to quantum mechanics and goes back to the very earliest days of quantum mechanics applied to solids. Well, why does this occur? This occurs because of the increasing kinetic energy of the electrons as you bring the particles closer and closer together. And at this critical juncture, this transition point, uh, they're no longer stable in these orbits. Now, this has important implications for bonding in molecules as well as in solids. So we have this very simple paradigm of pressure-induced freezing of molecules first on a lattice and then ultimately transforming to some kind of dense structure. The molecules are no longer stable. The atoms uh, that comprise them have electrons between them and the bonds are destabilized by this same sort of principle. This also reminds us that pressure is really uh, the, our knob. We're really interested in tuning energies, the combinations of very many, many energy components as a function of volume, and the negative volume derivative of the energy is just the pressure. So we're really looking at energy landscapes over a very wide range, assuming we can vary the interatomic distances or the intermolecular distances. So let's think about this in terms of chemistry in more detail. So we'll start with the venerable periodic table. And as you all know, it's organized on the basis of chemistry in terms of reactivity, but also in terms of quantum mechanics in terms of the filling of electron orbitals, the SPD shells. This gives rise to those solids, uh, particularly at the more the, at the top of the periodic table, that really have quite simple structures. Here's a FCC, BCC, HCP structure. What we find under pressure is, and these are just rules of thumb, with increasing pressure, elements tend to start looking like elements below them in a particular column, and also elements start behaving like those uh, to the, the right here uh, as a function of pressure. And this is due to something called orbital hybridization, the mixing of these orbitals uh, in a so-called S to D transition, for example. This was actually first po pointed out by Enrico Fermi. And this gives rise to rather complex structures and a complicated electronic structure that I'll show you. What this means, however, if we go to very high pressure, is our venerable periodic table really doesn't work as a guiding principle for the kinds of chemistry we see and the kinds of phenomena that are being observed. Really, it's much, much, much more complex than this kind of predictive tool uh, provides us. So there's really a need for an altogether new kind of periodic table in this new regime of chemistry. Well, what's made this possible in the past few years has been really extraordinary advan advances in experimental techniques. So this is very much an experimental talk. And this field of extreme conditions applied to molecules, pressure, and temperature is really driven uh, by developments in techniques. So it's a really, in a sense, a tool-driven uh, revolution in the words of Freeman Dyson as opposed to a conceptual revolution. And this has taken place over the last 30 years. And what's made it possible has been the development of a variety of tools based on instruments that use very strong materials for studying materials under sustained high pressures, and typically one uses diamond in some fashion because it is a very strong material and it's a window on the sample so you can watch materials uh, transform, behave in situ at high pressures and temperatures. But really, a large number of different kinds of tools based on this simple design have been developed, allowing a variety of different kinds of measurements to be done, including measurements of transport properties, of magnetic properties, electrical properties, one can actually make your own diamond and change the diamond, shape the diamond to do altogether new kinds of experiments. And all of this is combined with very large facilities, for example, X-ray facilities such as the Advanced Photon Source in the U.S., the Spallation Neutron Source in the U.S., the most powerful neutron scattering facility, various types of laser spectroscopies, including tabletop lasers, but in addition, very large lasers like the very largest laser on the planet, which is the National Ignition Facility, which is being used for these kinds of studies. So let's look at a couple of examples and return to what uh, Boyle called uh, 
touching the spring of the air and consider the most abundant component of the atmosphere, nitrogen, which, as you know, consists of these diatomic molecules with a very strong triple bond. With increasing pressure, one finds, as one uh, sees in the simple paradigm, there's pressure induced freezing on a lattice. The molecules are still intact, and actually, with increasing pressure, these molecules rearrange in various ways. But ultimately, at about 100 gigapascals, or one megabar, with some heating, you see a transformation the triple bonds break down and one forms this extended structure. This beautiful structure here, uh, which you could call diamond-like nitrogen, it's a polymeric form of nitrogen, stable at a megabar pressure. One can actually recover it in very small quantities of near atmospheric pressure. You can see the triple bonds are lost, and so it's actually a very high energy density material. The energy in those triple bonds is now distributed in the lattice as it's and it's storing a great deal of energy. I'll come back to this as a concept later on. So this is an example of a very simple kind of pressure-induced chemistry. One forms simple symmetric structures, which was really uh, the dogma for many, many years in high pressure. One tends to form compact symmetric structures with increasing density or increasing pressure. But it's really much more complex, and the best example of that is uh, what's been seen just in the last few years in another system, alkali metals, which for many years uh, were considered the textbook example of the simple metal, the free electron metal. And this goes back to the classic calculations of Wigner and Seitz uh, for sodium, for lithium, assuming this BCC structure. With increasing pressure, Initially, it goes to another structure that's quite symmetric, a close pack structure, FCC, but when one reaches roughly megabar pressures, one sees this emergent complexity. Uh, this particular structure forms C16, then another or an orthorhombic structure. This very complex structure, which you can see now, is far from compact, far from close packed. One sees an open structure occurring at very high density. In fact, you see now 11 different phases in sodium and in lithium. Sodium melts below room temperature. Lithium melts at a megabar below 200 Kelvin. And in fact, in this structure, sodium is transparent. So you have the reverse of this classic paradigm of pressure-induced metallization. You're starting with a metal, and you're making an insulator. Well, how does this happen? This is just discovered in the light within the last 10 years. What happens is one has a new kind of bonding. Instead of the electrons staying in the conduction band, Electrons start localizing in interstitial sites and form char uh, charged pairs, uh, bonding pairs. So you have a kind of bonding without nuclei. And you can see that after the fact when you do density functional calculations and look for where the electrons are going. And you find, in fact, a very large band gap for these metals. Really an astonishing result that was unexpected theoretically. Well, this is an example of bonding and physics uh, structures. Do we actually see new kinds of chemistry in terms of chemical reactivity? In fact, you do. An example of that is turning noble elements into ignoble elements. Uh, let's take the inert gases, for example, xenon. It's been found that xenon combines with hydrogen to form this structure here. It's a beautiful structure with dimers of xenon atoms suspended in what looks like a lattice gas of hydrogen molecules that are rotationally disordered. If one does uh, x-ray diffraction, one can pull out the electron density. With increasing pressure, you see the bleeding out of charge away from the xenons as the xenons try to reach out and bond and into the surrounding hydrogen lattice structure. So really, a very surprising result, a complex structure consisting of these de uh, uh, xenon dimers. Well, if there are major changes in electronic structure that lead to crystal structure changes. Uh, do we see changes at a more fundamental level? The notion of superconductors was mentioned in the previous talk. And it turns out that not only do we turn some insulators into metals, we can turn metals into insulators, we can turn insulators into superconductors. In fact, if one just looks at the elements, some 23 elements have been converted from non-superconducting states to superconducting states, some with rather high uh, transition temperatures.
And that includes oxygen, which is a gas. So here is an example of taking a gas and turning it into a superconductor at a megabar pressure. In addition, the highest TCs on record, the highest temperature superconductivity, is found in this particular cuprate, this mercury barium calcium cuprate, uh, which has a TC of 164 Kelvin, which remains the highest uh, to date. And that's a measurement at 30 gigapascals, or 300 kilobars. Well, now in a more benign regime, you might ask the question, well, are there effects on biomolecules and more delicate structures? In fact, there are. And in experiments that are just now uh, starting to become popular around the world, one can actually look at this in terms of the effect of pressure on whole organisms, that is, doing biology under extreme environments. You can use these same techniques that have been developed for chemistry and physics and apply them to biology. Here is a, a community of organisms in contact with ice at pressures of 24 kilobars, 2.4 gigapascals. We're looking through the diamonds, and you can see by ability, by various means, up, nutrient uptake, motility, and so on, at pressures as high as 25 kilobars. Really a remarkable finding showing that the pressure regime uh, over which known life can persist uh, is quite large, much, much larger than we thought. And there are important implications of this in astrobiology and the search for life elsewhere. In fact, this high pressure viability is now seen in all three domains of life. This particular example may be of particular interest for watery bodies uh, where one has uh, very dense water, dense ices um, at high pressure, such as the interior of Europa. Uh, so a very interesting result from the standpoint of astrobiology. There are, of course, imp important implications uh, for the Earth in terms of Earth's interior. So we really uh, have a new view of the interior of the Earth from the standpoint of the materials that comprise it. Uh, and in fact, this work continues. We continue to find new structures, new phases. Uh, these are new dense silicates, or so-called post-perovskite, very dense silicate uh, structures that occupy, we think, the region just uh, above the core, the, near the core mantle boundary at the bottom of the Earth's mantle. And the discovery of these, discovery of these in high pressure experiments allows to explain a number of uh, seismic and other geophysical observations. Also, one can see in experiments some altogether new kinds of minerals or potential minerals. You can take a volatile, a very abundant volatile, uh, for example, CO2, and turn it into a framework structure rather like the situation with nitrogen. Uh, this is CO2 in a uh, Cristobalite-like structure, which has a stability field, a range of stability uh, that maps onto the mantle of the Earth. So is this a high-pressure mineral? We don't know yet, uh, but we know from experiments it can exist. And in, in Bob Hazen's talk tomorrow, I believe he'll touch on some of these applications in his discussion of, um, of deep carbon. Well, this extends also to the other planets, of course, on uh, not just planets, but their moons. We now are looking at their interiors from the standpoint of the materials that comprise them. And this includes, of course, the largest planets, uh, the, largest plan the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, uh, which is predominantly hydrogen. And then beyond that, uh, looking at uh, exoplanets, uh, we have uh, opportunity for looking uh, at the same kinds of phenomena there. The case of hy uh, hydrogen and uh, Jupiter is quite important from the standpoint of missions. So this uh, explosive growth in high pressure experiments uh, is married with uh, increases in our knowledge from Earth observations, but also from space probes. And this mission to Juno, Ju this Juno mission to Jupiter uh, will address some of the questions that allow us to constrain uh, the interior of that planet, including uh, origin and evolution, the composition, the gravity, magnetic fields, internal structure, and whether it has a core. I mentioned exoplanets, so this uh, takes us uh, outside of our solar system. So this growing area of astronomy now includes planets well beyond our solar system. The, thousand or so extrasolar planets and planet candidates, many of which are exoplanets, and some of which are super-Earths. So this uh, touches on questions of now looking at 
the compositions and structures, uh, processes, origins of these bodies in terms of the chemistry that we know about. And for doing this, we need to understand the behavior of materials over a very, very wide range of, of pressures and temperatures. And in thinking about this, uh, it's important to focus in on those elements that are most abundant. This is a, a chart of the cosmic abundances. This is a log scale here, uh, principally what you measure uh, in our sun. And it reminds us that uh, hydrogen is perhaps the most important. So if we are to understand any of these phenomena in complex elements, we really need to understand hydrogen first. This is a list of some well-known scientists from uh, the past century and the current history, his, uh, century, starting with Kemerlung Onis, who was mentioned earlier, on up through Gaim and Novoselev. What do they have in common? Well, you can all say they are hydrogen Nobel Prize winners. Their work, or work they have done, contributed to our understanding of hydrogen or phenomena related to hydrogen, even the last two here, whose discovery of graphene actually uh, is a new finding that's quite relevant to hydrogen, and I'll touch at that, on that at the very uh, end of my talk. So the remainder of my talk will be about hydrogen element one, and uh, that will begin with a short review of what we know about hydrogen under pressure, and then I'll touch on some very recent results, including some results that were just published last Friday in PhysRev Letters. So this is a very current talk. So, why is this of interest from the standpoint of high pressure? Well, if you go back to the early days of quantum mechanics applied to solids, Eugene Wigner not only studied uh, the band structure, developed the techniques for understanding the free electron metal, the band structures of metals, for the alkalis, the heavier alkalis, sodium and, and lithium, but he also applied that same technique to hydrogen, the lightest alkali, and looked at its uh, stability and based on its stability, predicted that molecular hydrogen should transform to this alkali-like form of hydrogen. So one has the possibility of a metallic modification of hydrogen, and this was published in the third volume of the Journal of Chemical Physics. Because of its very interesting properties, both on a fundamental level and uh, for many applications which I'll come to, uh, Ginsburg identified the pursuit of this particular phase, or studying hydrogen as a function of pressure to very high pressures as one of the key problems in physics and astrophysics. Well, really, today, understanding hydrogen under the range of pressures that we now need to address a range of, of phenomena is an uns unsolved problem in science. It's really looking at more detail of importance because it, is a, it provides a test of fundamental theory. If one looks at the fundamental Hamiltonian for the hydrogen molecule, the hydrogen atom, it has this wonderful symmetry. And so understanding how this applies to hydrogen at very high densities constrains uh, very important aspects of the quantum mechanics of the nuclei as well as the electrons. It's the most abundant element, as I pointed out, so it's very important from the standpoint of planetary science and astrophysics. It's interesting from the standpoint of this chemical dichotomy that I alluded to. Uh, you can view it as an alkali, or you can view it as a halogen. You might think about this in terms of the 1S shell, whether it's a half-empty glass of water or a half-full glass of water. We would like to put it in the, in, the, uh, in the alkali column, but really it behaves like a halogen under ambient conditions. So pressure gives us some understanding, hopefully, of where we should really put this in Mendeleev's table. table. It's been predicted to be a high temperature superconductor, and this is touched on uh, because of its very uh, strong quantum properties. It could be a fluid ground state, that is, like helium, and this was discussed in the previous talk, at very high pressure, perhaps the quantum character of the hydrogen uh, system at very high pressure in a metallic state would mean it would never crystallize. It's a very much an open area of research right now from a theoretical point of view. And in that very high pressure state, it could be both superconducting uh, and superfluid, uh, depending on the isotope. It's an energetic material. If you could put it in this uh, dense metallic form, much more energetic than this polymeric form of nitrogen. And understanding it as a function of pressure to very, very high pressure and very high temperature uh, follows the path to 
inertial confinement fusion. So we really need to understand this if we're going to uh, pursue uh, ICF uh, research. And finally, from a practical standpoint, studies of hydrogen are very difficult in the laboratory. Uh, in fact, because of that difficulty, studies of hydrogen have really driven the development of high pressure temperature techniques. So a lot of the techniques that we've used to study other materials were first applied to hydrogen. This difficulty derives from the very uh, high compressibility of hydrogen and also its very high reactivity. I showed you how it can even react with uh, inert gases, although well, it reacts with most metals, so it's difficult to contain under extreme environments. But nevertheless, over the last few years, we've made, I think, significant progress, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, we'd like to think of hydrogen because of its quantum character as really the element of uncertainty because you need to treat the electrons and the protons on the same quantum footing. So, before going into the high pressure results and uh, uh, some very recent uh, data, uh, it's important to examine the key properties of the isolated molecule. So, as you all know, uh, the hydrogen molecule uh, has a very strong covalent bond. Its bond strength is 4.5 eV, roughly and it has 14 bound states, 14 vibrational states within this potential. If you look at the ground state, even though you have embedded in the molecule two nuclei, the electronic structure is very, very symmetric. It's actually quite spherical. And this is in the para state of the, uh, the hydrogen molecule for that particular isotope. So it's really quite spherical uh, and that's associated with this very, very strong covalent bond. What can we say happens in the solid? Well, many years ago, it was solidified. In fact, over a century ago, it was solidified under ambient conditions, and it has this hexagonal close-packed structure. One can also produce this by simply pressurizing at room temperature. And the thermodynamic properties of this phase, solid hydrogen, were worked out by Pauling, and it was Pauling who pointed out that the rotational disorder, the disordering, the molecules are actually rotationally disordered on these hexagonal close pack uh, sites in this structure, uh, gives rise to the residual entropy in this system. Well, what we now know from diffraction studies, despite the difficulty of studying hydrogen by diffraction techniques, both X-ray with only one electron per atom and neutrons, neutron scattering, which is very weak uh, in comparison to X-rays. We know, now know that this particular structure under a range of temperatures persists to at least 200 gigapascals, and this is what we call phase one. Well, most of our studies of hydrogen have come from spectroscopic studies, that is, studies at very, very high pressure uh, as a function of, of temperature. And of these spectroscopic studies, vibrational spectroscopy has been, been particularly important. So if one looks at the vibrational dynamics of this system, there are really three classes of excitations. There are the so-called rotons over here, which probe the rotational disorder, telling you whether you have the molecules ordered or not. You have the lattice modes, which are diagnostic of particular crystal structures. And then the so-called vibrons, which are the intramolecular stretching modes. And of course, uh, these vibrons are very characteristic of the molecular state. So this is a good signature of molecular bonding and the evolution or the potential evolution of the covalent bond in this system. This is basically the designation of these excitations according to Hertzberg. So how should we think about the effect of compression, say, on the intramolecular stretching mode, the vibron? Well, there are really two effects. So here's, our here's an intramolecular potential, and with increasing pressure, as you pack more molecules around a given molecule, you stiffen up that potential, and this causes an increase in frequency uh, with increasing pressure or increasing density. Well, there's a competing effect, and that is due to orbital interactions. So if you think about this in terms of the system wanting to form an extended structure, say, like nitrogen, uh, there's the bonding and the anti-bonding states, and with increasing pressure, there could be mixing of the anti-bonding states into the uh, ground state, uh, and this would cause a frequency decrease. 
So what do we observe experimentally? Well, we observe both. With increasing pressure, you see this increase over here uh, in frequency with increasing pressure, and that's followed by a decline on the right side. Here we're looking at the frequency shifts of the intramolecular mode probed by both Raman and infrared, and in the HCP structure, the infrared mode is formally forbidden because there's no dipole, but it has some weak activity due to these inter, uh, intramolecular, intermolecular interactions. Well, if one does this as a function of temperature, one can see more. You can see this increase in frequency and the decline, but you can also see these, see these breaks, uh, discontinuities in the vibrational frequencies. Uh, and these are diagnostic of phase transitions in the solid. So you can map this out as a function of P and T and map out the phase diagram here up to uh, roughly 200 gigapascals or 2 megabars, and you can see uh, there's phase 1, which we know is HCP, uh, there's this other phase, phase two, and phase three, uh, meeting at a triple point. This was worked out a number of years ago, and you can see a slight isotope effect, depending on whether you have deuterium or hydrogen. Well, is it a metal? Well, it turns out that uh, with increasing pressure, uh, there's a different mode of metallization, and that is uh, band overlap. Uh, and this was pointed out in a series of calculations done in the 1970s. What this means is there's a gap between the valence band and the conduction band for the molecules in the solid, and with increasing pressure, they can overlap. And this so-called indirect gap closes uh, to form a metal. So it's a metal, but the molecules are still intact. So a band overlap metal, uh, a second kind of metallization mechanism. Is there any e experimental evidence for that? Well, it turns out that a number of theoretical calculations all predicted at about 150 gigapascals that there should be this metallization where we see this transition uh, to phase three. When we do electrical conductivity measurements, we find, in fact, that it remains an insulator or at least a semiconductor up to these pressures. Uh, so it uh, is not a metal over that range of conditions in contrast to what we see in these other elements, some of which are superconductors. Well, vibrational spectroscopy actually led to a major surprise here. Instead of becoming a metal, it becomes an ionic material. That is, a type of charge transfer salt. There's a symmetry breaking, uh, a polarization that develops across the molecules. Instead of the electrons going into the conduction band, you get this symmetry breaking, and this preempts the metallization. Well, this is, uh, is an interesting result, also unexpected uh, theoretically, and it was also quite an interesting result because at similar pressures but at high temperatures, one sees a transition in fluid hydrogen. So at pressures of around 140 gigapascals, but now in the fluid state, and these are experiments that are probed by shock compression, one sees a, a transition from an insulating fluid to a conducting fluid. And these are a series of uh, theoretical calculations as well. This is from a recent review article. This is interesting from the standpoint of the behavior of hydrogen inside planets because this is the PT path that one follows in the case of the interior of Jupiter, and so it crosses here. So this suggests there could be a transition to a, transition to a conducting fluid over this range. Well, what can we say about the state of hydrogen in this range of pressures and temperatures? Well, we've done high temperature measurements now studying this vibron of the intramolecular stretching mode, and we see that the molecules are stable over this very wide range, so it seems to be molecular in this dense fluid, and we need to now move off into this region to look at the conducting fluid. But clearly there's a need for higher uh, pressure measurements at higher temperature measurements. We've gone back to this in the last few years, uh, and we've used synchrotron IR spectroscopy principally to probe this, to higher pressure. Here we have infrared measurements showing this excitation, this fibron excitation, now up to 360 gigapascals. This, by the way, is well over an order of magnitude higher than the predicted uh, transition pressure by Wigner and Huntington, so the molecules are stable. And in work that was just published uh, last week, as a function of temperature now, at these kinds of pressures, one sees a change in structure of the spectrum at high temperature, evidence for a new phase. So this is our current view of the phase diagram. Here are the phases one, two, and three. We now have a fourth phase in here. These are the transition lines for the fluid that are coming down, and also this is downturn in the melting. 
which is reminiscent of what we have in the alkali metals. So clearly very interesting phenomena in here that we're exploring where all these lines seem to meet. Well, is hydrogen metallic at these uh, conditions? Here's a photograph of a sample at 3.6 megabars, and you can see uh, in reflected light that it's black. It's very dark in reflectivity. If one looks at the synchrotron infrared absorption spectrum out to as the longest wavelengths that we can go, oh, this is down to about a tenth of an electron volt, so this is mid-infrared. One sees basically a transparent sample, uh, but there is this evidence for a slight upturn uh, in the uh, in the absorption and the reflectivity. This is very reminiscent. You think you could wrap up in, uh, say, two minutes? Yeah, okay. And I have a question immediately. OK. <laughs> right now? What, what about two-photon absorption? Oh, this, is all, this is all one photon. You can do uh, two-photon absorption, uh, but the intensity of the synchrotron source is not high enough for, for two-photon activity. The bottom line is uh, this is consistent with a semi-metallic state, rather like what you have in the case of graphite. And the magnitude of the upturn in reflectivity and absorption uh, is consistent with electrical conductivity measurements that have been carried out. Well, this is quite interesting now, because if you look at the vibrational frequencies, you see now two different kinds of hydrogens, strongly interacting hydrogens, weakly interacting hydrogens in this structure. So again, an example of a very complex, now anisotropic structure, far from close packed, uh, a symmetry breaking of a high order, in fact, and this structure really uh, based on the analysis of the spectra and calculations shows graphene sheets of hydrogen in a layered structure where you have the strongly interacting molecules in the graphene layer and weakly interacting molecules between them. This was a big surprise, however, chemists knew about this a long time ago. Uh, Dudley Hirschbach, in fact, predicted at high pressure that there that there is stability of six-membered rings of hydrogen at high density uh, in a type of aromatic cluster, rather like what you have in, the, in benzene. He published this, this in a paper in the Journal of Physical Chemistry where it was buried for many, many years, and uh, people were unaware of those results. So this is an example of, of what we, we see here in the, in the layers, different kinds of distortions of the hydrogen molecules in this graphene ring. Here is a, an image showing calculations of the electronic structure, showing the evolution of the bonding above and below the layer. So it's very much like carbon graphene. In fact, the electronic structure maps onto the electronic structure of carbon graphene uh, beautifully. At higher pressure, still different structures. Evidence for this interstitial electron density, like we have in the other alkali metals, these structures have not yet been uh, seen yet. And the still higher pressure, I mentioned the possibility of superconductivity and superfluidity. This is the vortex structure that's been calculated for superfluid, superconducting hydrogen at 400 GPA, uh, which we are, of course, trying to contain and study. But this remains simply a prediction. And beyond the range that I just described, in the case of hydrogen, we're really looking at a very large domain if we want to understand this most abundant element in the visible universe. This is log density or this is log temperature. We're simply in this range here, and there's a wide range of phenomena out here that's predicted theoretically or observed in astrophysical measurements. And to explore that, we need very large facilities to generate high pressures and temperatures, such as the National Ignition Facility. So here are some conclusions. Uh, the bottom line is that we have now an entirely new mechanism of hydrogen metallization, and the discovery of graphene-like hydrogen really ties together a lot of loose ends, and I think is an important advance on our understanding of this problem that goes back to the early years of quantum mechanics. And thank you very much. I need to acknowledge my collaborators, and I'll share this image with you again. Thank you. Thank you.